Thanks, everyone, for coming here. I promise I'm only going to mention the book a couple of times. Um, so I'm going to talk about Kubernetes uh, as a platform, uh, or is it just a foundation? So I don't know about you, but I, I read a lot of articles and see presentations with really amazing stuff, uh, engineering around Kubernetes, you know, tools, dif automation, different uh, ways of using the technology. Um, and it's really impressive. But very often, there's very little context about the organization. It's usually, well, we are team X at organization Y, and that's it. And I think about you know, technology adoption, particular Kubernetes, um, is really the key to, to the success of this technology, right? So if we don't really know who asked for this, who has the need for this technology, uh, who is you know, implementing, who is providing, and which ways, and, and especially how is the adoption? Are the teams actually um, buying into this, this new offering, these new tools, et cetera, um, or not? So to me, that's key, right? And so in the book, Team Topologies, that I co-wrote with Matthew Skelton, we talk about so we talk about some fundamental types of teams and what are the expected um, behaviors and purpose of different teams, but perhaps more importantly, about the interactions between teams, because that's what's going to drive adoption of technology. Um, and so if we don't take that into consideration, we might fall into traps where we're building things that no one needs or you know, the, 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 the case for, for that technology or that service is not really clear, or there are uh, miscommunications and teams don't know who can help them and so on. So we try to, to address that. And today I'm going to talk about is Kubernetes really a platform? What is team cognitive load and what does it have to do with platforms? Um, what are some kind of team interaction patterns that we can apply? And then at the end, some ideas on how to get started if you want to have this kind of team-centric approach to Kubernetes adoption. So to answer this question, is Kubernetes a platform? We basically, we need to define what a platform is, right? Because it's a term that's been overloaded, it's been around for a long time, so it has a lot of different meanings. But before I do that, I want to tell you a quick story. Um, about a year ago, Melanie Sebula, an infrastructure engineer at uh, uh, Airbnb, was here on stage at QCon, and she gave this excellent talk. And as Daniel mentioned, I'm also the DevOps lead editor for InfoQ, and I wrote a story about it. And something interesting happened. In the first week alone of this being published, the story had more than 23,000 page views. And to give you an idea, over the lifetime of a, a story at InfoQ, you know, several months or a year, typically you get kind of 10 to 20% of this amount of page views. So it was like my first proper viral uh, story, if you like. So I was trying to understand why this one in particular got so much attention. And yes, Airbnb helps, and Kubernetes is, is all the rage. But I think it was the fact that I was talking about simplifying the Kubernetes adoption for, uh, at a large scale for th uh, thousands of engineers. And that comes, brings us to the point that it feels, for many developers and many engineers, f feels very uh, complicated. And it takes a lot of effort to actually adopt Kubernetes and understand how do I need to change the way I work today. Um, how, what is the, how is the API? What kind of uh, artifacts I need to produce to use it effectively? Because, yes, Kubernetes, let's say it's a platform. In a sense, it provides, you know, um, helps us deal with complexity of operating microservices. It helps um, provide better abstractions for um, deploying and running our services. So that's all good, so great, but there's a lot. Of, a lot else going on, right? So we need to think about, you know, how do we size the, our hosts? Um, how many clusters? How do we create destroy clusters and when? How do we update to new Kubernetes versions and who is going to be impacted? And um, decide on how do we isolate uh, different environments, different applications, you know, with namespaces or clusters or whatever it might be. And I'm sure if you work directly with Kubernetes, you, you have another long list that you could insert here. Um, perhaps also around worrying about security, for example. So a lot of things that need to happen, right, for us to actually be able to use Kubernetes as a platform. So the question is, you know, who is the provider? Who is kind of the, the owner responsible to, to do all of this? Um, and who is the consumer? What, who are the teams that actually want to benefit from the um, Kubernetes platform, let's say? 
Um, and oftentimes in organizations, this is not very clear. So the, the boundaries are kind of blurry. Um, so it's kind of complicated to understand you know, who is responsible for what, uh, what are the implications of the decisions we make on other teams. So let's start with the definition of a platform. So I like this one from Evan Butcher, where he's saying digital platform is a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, and services, um, but also knowledge and support, and everything arranged as a compelling internal product. So we know, yes, self-service tools and APIs are very important. They're a you know, critical pattern to allow teams to be more independent and do the work they need uh, autonomously. But I want to point out that he's talking about knowledge and support. So that kind of implies we need teams around this, teams that can help um, the consumer, consuming teams understand, onboard the platform, uh, provide support when there are problems, issues of understanding how the platform works. And the other aspect that's important, he's talking about the compelling internal product. So this is not a mandatory platform that we say, well, all these shared services are in this box, and now you must use it. This is kind of what we've been doing for a long time, and it doesn't work very well. It often creates more problems, more pain for the teams that have to use it than, than the benefits they bring. So we actually have to think about uh, the platform as a product. It's internal, it's for our internal teams, but it's still a product. So we're gonna see what that implies in practice. But the key idea of this talk is that Kubernetes by itself is not the platform, it's the foundation. It's awesome, brings us all this, um, Great functionality, auto-scaling, self-healing, service discovery, you, know, you name it. But a good product is more than that. You need to think about the usability. How do we make this uh, easy to use and adopt? Think about the reliability, the support around the platform. So it's the foundation. It's not the whole thing. And the good platform, as Evan Botcher says, should kind of pave the road, create a path of least resistance and essentially make the right thing the easy thing to do with the platform. But what is the right thing depends on your context. It's not that uh, we can say, well, whatever Kubernetes does is the right thing. No, it depends on our context. It depends on the teams that are going to consume the platform, where they're coming from, what kind of help they need, and so on. So the hard thing, or one of the hard things about platforms, is that the needs of the consumers are going to change over time. The teams that are uh, using the platform probably are going to start having more specific requests and needs for what they, they want to do. Uh, and at the same time, you're probably always going to have new teams or new, engineering, new engineers onboarding the platform as well. So it has to be uh, understandable and usable for them. And this changes all the time. It keeps evolving, right? As does the, the ecosystem of the technology, uh, Kubernetes in this case. And so Kubernetes is not exactly a small thing, right? It's more like uh, this elephant coming into the room. So how do we adopt this technology in a way that is um, not causing more pain than the benefits it brings? Because you don't want to end up with something like this, where we go back to kind of the origins of, of DevOps movement and having uh, groups that are isolated, just that now instead of being ops, it's the Kubernetes, which is cooler, but it's still if you have this kind of isolationist approach, approach where one group makes decisions independent from the other group, then you're going to run into the same kind of problems. So definitely this is not what we want. And one of the reasons is that if we are making decisions without considering the impact on the consumers is that we're going to increase their cognitive load. You know, the amount of effort for the teams to actually be able to use the platform. And so cognitive load has a specific definition from John Sweller as the total amount of um, mental effort being used in the working memory. So, and we can break this down into three different types of cognitive load. The first one is intrinsic. It means, for example, if I'm a Java developer, I need to know how to write classes in Java, right? Uh, if I don't know that, then it's, this is taking some uh, effort on my memory. I have to Google it or I have to try to remember. Extraneous cognitive load has to do with any kind of tasks that are needed to actually de de deliver the, the, the work I'm doing to the customers or to um, production. So if I have to remember about how do I deploy this application or how do I access this test environment or this staging environment or how do I clean up test data, all these things that are not directly related to the problem I'm trying to solve, but things that I need to, to get done. 
That's kind of the extraneous cognitive load. And then finally, germane cognitive load is everything around the actual business domain I'm working for, kind of the problem space. So everything that I, I need to know to solve some kind of problem. Um, so for example, if I'm working in uh, private banking, I need to know how bank transfers work, for example. So you kind of, at least in the software delivery world, you can kind of generalize a little bit into intrinsic cognitive load it has to do with all the skills I need to do my work. Extraneous has to do with all the mechanics, things that need to happen to deliver the, the value. And germane is everything around the domain that I'm trying to um, provide value and, and solve problems, et cetera. So we, we want to minimize the intrinsic cognitive load, and we know how to do that. We can do, have you know, classical training for people, or we do pair programming, um, mentoring, code reviews, all these good techniques that help uh, upskill people. We also want to minimize the extraneous cognitive load, and this is where um, team topologies, and in particular platform teams, come in. So this is what we're going to explore uh, throughout the rest of the talk. And the point is to make as much memory uh, available to focus on the germane cognitive part. So if you're interested in this topic, you can, have a, you can search for hacking your head. So Joe Pierce has uh, several articles and presentations that go um, deeper into this. But in general, kind of keep this in mind as a kind of principle to be mindful of the platform choices impact on the team's cognitive load. So I want to talk a little bit. So I mentioned the Airbnb example. So how were they reducing the cognitive load on their development teams? Well, there's this famous quote, right? The best part of my day is when I update 10 different YAML files to deploy a one-line code change. Said no one ever, right? Um, and so they were feeling this pain. Some of their teams were feeling the pain of you know, embarking on Kubernetes without some kind of help to reduce this amount of cognitive load. And so what they did was it's quite simple. They, had, they created a, a simple command line tool, um, kubegen, which allows the application teams or the service teams to focus on a smaller set of uh, configuration and details around that are specific to their project or the services. So and you know they need to um, define what are which which files and volumes that they need to mount and Docker files, etc. But just you know what's specific, more related to kind of the germane aspect of their work, and everything else is generated. All the boilerplate code uh, configuration is generated by this um, command line tool, uh, and so and for different environments. So they have production, canary, and development environments, and so this simplifies. Uh, and makes it much easier for development teams to focus on, on the germane part. So essentially, we want to clarify the boundaries of the platform, of the services provided by the platform, um, and provide good abstractions so we reduce cognitive load on the teams. In team topologies, we, we talk about these four different um, types of teams. So stream-aligned teams um, kind of are the ones that provide the um, customer and customer value. And then three other types of teams that uh, support and help reduce cognitive load. So enabling teams, complicated subsystem teams, and platform teams. So today we're going to focus on platforms. And so if you think about the stream aligned team that's kind of the heartbeat of, of delivering business value or customer value, then the platform team is kind of shielding uh, the details of the lower level services that these teams need to use for deployment, automation, for monitoring, CI, CD, whatever it might be. And the stream team is essentially similar to this um, idea of a product team, or some places it's called a DevOps team, other places called a build and run team, but teams that have end-to-end -end ownership of the services that they deliver. Um, and so they have runtime ownership as well, and they can take feedback from monitoring, from um, customer usage, customer feedback into the next iterations of the service or um, application. So we call this stream-aligned teams it's for two reasons, essentially. Product is kind of another um, overloaded term. And the more and more complex our systems become and involving uh, hardware and so on, then it's, the, it's kind of blurry to say this is your product. And also, there are different types of streams that we can think about. So not just the, the, the business 
or the uh, value streams, but also it can be around compliance, can be around specific user personas that we think are very different from other user personas. Whatever makes sense to align the teams providing uh, that kind of value with that stream. And I want to talk about another example, in this case, U switch. So for the people in the UK, uh, use switch should be uh, very familiar. So they help compare different kind of uh, utility providers and home services and make it easy to um, switch between them. And now they're part of this uh, RVU group that does similar thing for financial services. So a couple of years ago, I saw this article by Paul Ingalls talking about convergence to Kubernetes. So this got my attention. Um, and I think this article is really good at kind of bringing together, you know, what is the technology we're trying to adopt? How do, does that help or not our teams and the people uh, doing their work better? And also bring some data in to actually uh, look at this in a more meaningful way. So in that article, there's this graph, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, these are kind of measuring all the low level AWS service calls. Uh, being done by the different teams. So a bit of context, uh, when, the, when you switch started, every team was responsible for some service and they were as autonomous as you know, possible. They were responsible to create their own AWS accounts, um, security groups, networking, et cetera. So they did everything inside the team to, in order to be as autonomous as possible. Um, but over time, we saw, they saw that the amount of calls to these services was increasing. And at the same time, this correlated to this feeling that teams were, you know, over time, kind of getting slower at delivering uh, new features, new value for the business. And so what they wanted to do by adopting Kubernetes was not necessarily to bring in the technology. Yes, it helped, but also actually use that to change the organization structures, to introduce, essentially introduce infrastructure platform team um, and, and try to address the problem that teams were facing of too much cognitive load, having to understand all these different AWS services at kind of lower level. So I thought that was very powerful. And once they introduced the platform, they started to see, in fact, a decrease in this uh, amount of tra traffic through um, AWS directly. And I find this interesting because it's kind of a proxy for the cognitive load on the application teams. And the way they did this is very aligned to what we talk about as you know, platform team purpose is always to enable the stream aligned teams to reduce, um, to work more autonomously with the self-service capabilities and in order to reduce the extraneous cognitive load we talked about before. So if we keep this in mind, this is a very different starting point from saying, well, we're gonna put all shared services in a platform. That's a very different approach. So it can drive different types of decisions. So Paul Ingalls also said um, they wanted to keep the principles they had from the beginning, which was to uh, promote autonomy of teams, reduce the, the amount of coordination needed to do the work, and provide the self-service type of infrastructure platform. And we, we talked about treating the platform as a product, internal product, but still a product. So what does that mean more specifically? Well, we should be thinking about the reliability of the platform, is it fit for purpose? Is it actually um, helping with the problems that the users have today, our uh, engineering teams? And does it focus on the developer experience as a kind of key driver to um, how we implement and how we um, offer the platform services? So specifically, for the platform to be reliable, we need to have some kind of on-call support because now the, the platform is kind of in the path of production. So if our monitoring services provided by the platform are failing or we, don't, we run out of storage space for logs, for example, uh, then the customer-facing teams are going to suffer, right? They won't be able to, to get that kind of information. So they need to, to have someone and a team that provides support and tells them you know, what's going on, what is the expected response time to fix that platform service. It should be easy to understand the current status of different services in the platform, um, and we should have clarity on what are the preferred communication channels between the platform and the stream teams. So if there's an incident, how do you report that? 
if you want to provide feedback, how do you do it? And if you need help, uh, how do you contact us? So are, do we use some Slack channels or we prefer that you call us directly in some situations? You know, make that clear. It's, it's very easy and it's going to, again, help reduce cognitive load of teams when they have problems with the platform. They know exactly how they have to deal with it instead of you know, wondering how should I now approach the platform team. Um, and finally, if you have downtime or perhaps it's just degraded performance, if you're updating to a new Kubernetes version, for example, then we need to plan that and coordinate with the teams that might be impacted. Um, we can't just assume, oh, it's, it's going to be fine. Having a platform that's fit for purpose means that we use techniques like prototyping. We get regular feedback from our customers. I mean, they are part of our organization. It's not like uh, often we have difficulties to get feedback from customers that are outside the organization. They're right there, so we should uh, take advantage of that. And use you know, iterative practices, agile, um, pair programming, TDD, all these things that help us you know, get um, faster delivery with, with higher quality. And also very importantly, we should focus on less services of higher quality, of higher availability, rather than trying to do everything that we can. It's just focus on what we really need and make sure those are of high quality. So this means we need good product management to um, understand priorities, make sure our uh, roadmap is clear to everyone, um, and so on. And finally, focusing on the developer experience, kind of the usability of the platform, then it should speak the same language as our uh, development teams, right? Um, it should provide usage of the services in a way that it's, it's straightforward for them. Um, and sometimes you might need to make trade-offs. You know, if, if the development teams are not familiar with YAML, but you might say, well, it's, it's pretty easy, so the cost is low, and it's going to help us in the long term that all the development teams understand YAML, then sure, go ahead. But it's not always a straightforward decision, and especially it should not be a decision we make um, without considering the impact on, on the development teams or the consuming teams. And we should provide the right levels of abstractions for our teams today. Again, contextualize. Um, and over time, this might change. Might, we might um, have better abstractions or higher level abstractions, but we all should be looking at what, what makes sense today, given the kind of maturity engineering practices of our teams today. So at uh, USwitch, this is um, some of the things Kubernetes helped them with was to have this kind of more application focused, abs focused abstractions, talking about services, deployments, ingress, rather than kind of a lower level um, services abstractions that they were using before with AWS. Um, and it also helped them minimize coordination, which was another of the key principles. So I talked with, with Paul Ingalls and also with Tom Booth, who's here today, um, about their journey. And it's quite interesting, not just what they did, but how they, how they did it. So some of the things that the platform team helped uh, the stream teams with, their service teams, was uh, things like providing dynamic database credentials, because they were all static before, uh, multi-cluster load balancing, and also making it much easier to get alerts for their uh, customer-facing services and actually define the SLOs and have that visibility in, in a much easier way. So, for example, the service-level objectives uh, is actually a service in the platform that the teams can configure and get these kind of dashboards and the notifications in Slack when the, the threshold for the, for the service has been... Um, um, has, you know, the, something dropped uh, be, below the threshold, etc. And so this made it very easy for teams to adopt this kind of good practices. And it's all mostly based on, on custom resources that they created. So because their teams are familiar with, with YAML and they can just do these configurations and get these this, uh, services benefits very quickly. But like I said, I thought the journey they took is also very, very interesting, not just kind of technical achievements. Um, so about two years ago, they started this infrastructure platform with only a few services, and they first identify their kind of the first customer. Um, so one of the teams that was struggling a little bit, so they didn't have any centralized logging or actual metrics and auto-scaling ability, um, and so, you know, this team, they, they talk with them and they realize, you know, if we 
are able to help you with some services around these aspects, then you know, that's going to be a first kind of success. Um, and then sometime later, they started to kind of define their own SLAs and SLOs for the platform. Essentially, kind of uh, promoting the platform with the rest of the, the teams and kind of highlighting the type of performance levels and you know, latency and quite kind of the uh, reliability of the platform for the other teams so that they can make uh, informed decision if they should adopt the platform services or not. Remember, it, it, had, it was never mandated. It was always optional. And I thought it was interesting, as Tom told me, they, they started looking at the traffic going through the platform, the Kube platform, uh, versus what was going um, directly through AWS. And they started to see an increase, so growing traffic through the platform. So this kind of gave them some idea of, of the adoption that was going on. And then later, they, um, as I mentioned, addressed some kind of cross-functional gaps that several teams had around uh, security, also some, some helpful things for GDPR, that data privacy, and you know, handling data, uh, and alerts and SLOs that I mentioned, and kind of um, informal metric I call them here um, highest money-making team. It's just, a, it's just a joke. It's not how they refer to it. But there was clearly a team that had the services that were generating more revenue. And this team was also kind of the more advanced in engineering terms. And so they were already doing all the stuff that the platform provided. So for them, there was not a significant motivation to adopt the platform until they realized actually it provides the same functionality with the same kind of reliability, performance, et cetera. So it doesn't make sense anymore for us to do this on our own. We can just use the platform and have more um, capacity available to focus on, on the service and the business. So it's kind of their ultimate prize, right? So having some kind of metrics is, it can be quite useful. So in terms of platform metrics, uh, I want to highlight four different types of metrics, categories. Um, so we said the platform is a product itself. So we can look at uh, product metrics, for example, uh, from the book Accelerate by Dr. Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Jin Kim. So they talk about these four key metrics that are um, closely related to high-performing teams. So high-performing teams do very well along these metrics. Uh, so lead time, deployment frequency, uh, MTTR, and so on. So we can look at this to help guide our own platform service uh, delivery and operations. Another type of metrics that can be useful are user satisfaction. These are very important, right? If we're creating product for you know, um, any kind of users, we want to make sure it helps them do their job, that they're happy with it, and they recommend it to other people. So there's a, a very simple example from Twilio. Um, it's a company based in the US. And what they do, their platform team does is, I think every quarter they send out this survey asking their engineering teams, uh, how well do you feel the platform helps you build, deliver, and run your services? And also, how compelling is it in the sense, do you feel like we're listening to your feedback and making the platform better uh, and more adequate to your needs? Do you feel like you have the right tools uh, in place um, to help you do your job? And so you can look at this over time and see trends. And sometimes you might see kind of the satisfaction go down. And it's not necessarily about the technical services. Perhaps it's just the platform team was so busy that they were not listening to feedback. Um, and so again, it's not just about the technology. It's also the interactions between the, the teams. Another type of metric relates, obviously, to adoption engagement. So in the end, what we want for the platform to be successful is that it's adopted. It means it's serving its purpose. Um, so we can look at very simple ways in terms of you know, how many teams are kind of on board the platform, are using services versus how many teams are not, kind of basic adoption metric. But then we can also look per platform service, uh, how much engagement there is, how many of the different services or teams are using this particular platform um, functionality. And that might give us also some hints in terms of, well, this service did really well, was adopted very quickly, and this other service we expected to get adoption didn't. So why was that? What did we do different, or how did, did we behave differently that caused these two platform services to have very different uh, kind of engagement metrics? 
And finally, the reliability of the platform itself, uh, as in the example from uSwitch, is, is quite important as well. Um, and so, in fact, they had their own SLOs for the platform, and this was uh, obviously um, available to all the teams. And you know, making sure we, we provide that information is quite important. So these are just examples. Obviously, in your own context, you might have different metrics, but kind of the, the types and categories that we should be looking at are, should be more or less the same. In the end, remember the success of platform teams is the success of the stream-aligned teams. These two things are, go together. Um, and it's the same for other type of, of supporting teams. Um, and so I've mentioned several times the team interactions are also critical. It's not just about making technology available. So at Airbnb, essentially what they did was to have this kind of platform team, right? Um, abstracting a lot of the underlying details of, the, of their Kubernetes uh, platform. Um, and what this does is kind of clarify the service boundary of the platform for the development teams in their case, uh, and also make that kind of much smaller surface than just saying, well, now use Kubernetes. Now, you know, go and read documentation about the API and understand how it works. That's kind of a huge task. That's going to put on a lot of effort on development teams. And this kind of approach is what helps really reduce cognitive load by providing uh, much more focused uh, services that are fit for what our teams need. So to do this, we need some kind of good behaviors, if you like. Um, so when we're starting a new platform service or we're evolving an existing service, then we expect there to be strong collaboration between platform teams and uh, at least one of the stream teams that has the need for the new service. So we expect this strong collaboration in the beginning for this kind of discovery period where we're trying to understand what do you need, um, what can be a good solution, how is the inter should the interface look like to make it usable for you. And then once we get the service more stable, if you like, more known, then we should focus as a platform team more on what is the support around the service, is the documentation um, up to what you know, people need to be able to uh, onboard and get on board the service. So it's more like uh, access a service, right? We don't expect to be for the teams to have to collaborate anymore, but we just expect one team is providing a service that the other is consuming. Now, this doesn't mean that the platform kind of hides everything away and the development teams are not like allowed to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Um, that's not the point. I mean, we, we still know that it's Kubernetes-based platform and we should not uh, disallow teams to kind of provide their feedback and or suggest, you know, there's this new tool or new way of doing things that we think is useful and kind of we should promote that kind of engagement and discussion between development or stream teams and platform teams. And then over time, platforms typically are going to grow. We should start with a small set of services and only create services that we have um, a valid need for. But typically, over time, it grows. So for example, this is kind of inspired on, on the Airbnb example. Um, if you have these two services, uh, kubegen and Cube Deploy, but if you realize, for example, troubleshooting services in Kubernetes can be quite complicated. So I found out this recently. There's actually a flow chart of you know, if you have a problem in your service, you know, what should you look at and how to navigate that? This is just the, the top half of that chart, right? So there's another half. Um, so it's quite impressive to create that, that chart, but this is not something you want your engineering teams to have to go through every time there's a problem. Um, and so what they actually did at um, Airbnb was to, you know, together with the teams, understand what kind of information they normally need when they want to diagnose the problem. Um, what kind of uh, issues they see occurring on a kind of regular basis. Um, so they, they follow this pattern of you know, this discovery period, then we understand better what the service should look like, and at some point it becomes clear enough and stable enough that can be um, consumed by all the stream teams. And then you have this new service, K-Diagnose, that you know, gets all the information, all the logs, all the 
the data you might, that might be useful, perhaps already does some kind of automated checks on if this looks different than what I was expecting, that might be an indication where the problem is and so on. People recognize this, I'm sure Daniel does, and other people. This is the cloud native landscape. So when I copy this image and I uh, dragged it onto Google Slides, um, it failed because it was too big to process, right? So I had to resize it. Um, but essentially, just give you an idea how the landscape is, is, is so broad. Uh, how do we deal with this? So having this type of platform also help us to kind of evolve. And this should be part of the role of the platform teams to kind of follow the technology lifecycle. We know how important that is. Um, and so having those kind of clear service boundaries and abstractions, perhaps I can do, you know, I, there's some new tool that I can use that helps at the platform level and the interface for the stream teams doesn't change. So I could do that kind of replacement uh, transparently or perhaps not. Some other aspect, some other service of a platform that I want to evolve and use some new technology, but it's going to imply a change in the interface. Then I need to talk with the stream teams, understand effort on them, uh, when it makes sense to do this, this kind of change. So it kind of helps us at least have a better visibility on how do I evolve the, the kind of underlying technology landscape inside my platform. And the same for adopting open source. Uh, so this is uh, from USwitch. This is related to the SLO um, as a service aspect, uh, but there are many more. So Zalando, for example, has really cool stuff around uh, cluster lifecycle management and, and other open source tools. So not just for those in the, in the kind of official cloud uh, native landscape, uh, but also you know, all this other open source that we can, if it makes sense for us, if we think this is useful for our organization, we can um, adopt that and then understand what needs to change at the, the kind of the interface level with the stream teams or not, or is transparent. So some final ideas on, you know, if you want to start and have this kind of team-focused approach to Kubernetes adoption, how can you get started? So three points. First, you can start by assessing the cognitive load on, the, on your development teams or uh, stream teams. You know, how easy is it for them to understand the current platform based on Kubernetes? Uh, what are the abstractions they need to know about? Does this... Um, you know, is this easy for them to understand, to use, or are they struggling? So it's a matter of just asking them and trying to get a feel for what are the kind of the problems that they're, they're facing today. So remember the Airbnb story? That was why so many people were attracted to that story because it was uh, clear that this causes a lot of kind of um, difficulties and a little bit of anxiety to have to use this all, whole new platform without the right kind of... Uh, support and uh, by a platform. Number two, you can make it much more clear what is your platform. So this is often uh, is something very simple, but we don't always do it. Like, what are exactly the services we have in the platform? Who is responsible? Which teams? Um, and then all the other aspects that I mentioned before on a kind of a, a real digital platform. So what is the on-call support? What are the communication mechanisms that we prefer? Etc. All this should be clear. So you can start today by looking at, given my Kubernetes implementation, you know, what is the gap with, the, with kind of that idea of digital platform and the kind of things I should have in place and address those. And number three, um, clarifying the team interactions, being more intentional about you know, when should we collaborate, when should we expect to have, use this as, you know, consume this service uh, without requiring actual um, collaboration. Um, how do we develop new services? You know, who needs to be involved for how long? It shouldn't be, we say, well, we're going to collaborate and it shouldn't be open-ended. It should be, we expect to collaborate for uh, two weeks or two months to understand what is the service you need to discover the kind of good solutions. And then at some point, it's going to change to X as a service. So there are a lot of platform examples that you can look at um, from many companies, from uh, Zalando to Twilio and Adidas, Mercedes. Um, kind of the common theme is looking at the platform in this kind of uh, that definition of, of a digital platform as not just the technical services, but actually 
providing the good support, providing the, the right um, on-call documentation, all these things that actually make the platform easy to use for their teams and really accelerate their kind of capacity to deliver and operate their software more independently, more autonomously. I also wrote an article which goes a bit uh, deeper around the ideas in this talk. So if you're interested, um, that's available as well. And that's it. Thank you so much for attending, and I hope this was useful. <laughs> we have some time for questions, sure. Question there. Uh, my question is, uh, what is your view on having a single team for development and for platform management? So can you say that again, similarity between? Uh, having a same team for platform management, like platform activities and for development activities. Um, so, you can have different kind of structures inside the platform. So uh, it might start as a single team providing a couple of services, like in, in an example uh, from your switch. And then over time, typically, as the platform grows and you have more services, you, you start to have kind of teams aligned to, to services inside the platform. So that's kind of a, a common pattern. But essentially, platforms can kind of manifest in different ways, and you might have different platforms inside the same organization. Some focus more on kind of lower level services, other perhaps on kind of data APIs and things that, that um, different teams are gonna need and make sense in a platform. I think one part of the question there, Mamo, was what uh, about having the same team doing platform and application responsibilities? Does, so, that, does that work? So the difficulty there is then if this team is responsible for you know, kind of a runtime of uh, customer-facing services. But so that's one type of product, but then they're also responsible for platform services, which are also its own product. Then how do you manage that? And it's probably going to be, again, too much uh, cognitive load on the team. And so it, this idea of, of having stream teams that are autonomous as much as possible means that they have ownership of the runtime as well. Um, in some cases, and, and you might have things like SRE teams that when you have a certain scale that you actually need. Um, so SRE makes sense, for example, if the services get to a scale of that asking a single team to uh, be able to handle the runtime and, and, and scale appropriately is, is not effective. It's just too much. They would spend all their, most of the time doing that. Uh, so that's obviously what, what happens at Google, where some services have such a scale that you need a SRE team to handle that, but in general, you will want to stream align teams to have the full ownership of their, of their services. Any more questions at all? Can I ask a quick one, Memo? Um, what's your thoughts about, say, using the platform team to build a hybrid cloud solution? Have you got any thoughts on, on that in terms of cognitive load? Then I'm thinking I've got to learn Amazon, I've got to learn Google, I've got to learn Azure, maybe. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? So. From the point of view of the platform teams, um, you actually want to probably align the teams with kind of what is the, the service that they're providing to the streams. So whether that means the same platform team needs to understand different uh, cloud providers or on-prem and, and public cloud, um, then you need to, that makes more sense than kind of splitting by, by a provider because then you, you're not providing consistent, uh, not giving a consistent interface to the stream teams. So it can help kind of thinking again, going back to what is the purpose of platform, provide services that reduce cognitive load, then we should not put kind of the onus of understanding all the different uh, cloud providers or on the stream teams. We want to try to avoid that. Very nice, thank you. I've got another question there. Hi, um, great presentation. Um, have you come across uh, platform teams that have felt disintermediated when you had streamlined teams uh, venture into the serverless world? Sorry, say that again. 
So if you've got streamlined teams that look at the options around Kubernetes or maybe the yep. product that's offered by a platform team and said, nah, don't want that, we'll go to serverless. We have less cognitive load and it solved the problem. And we've, got a, we've reduced our cycle time to release some value to the client. Yes, that's, that's a very good question and it's, it's quite common because we're talking about platform not being mandatory. And so, you know, w should we allow teams to just decide, uh, stream teams to decide on, on very different uh, approach or technology? Um, hopefully, if that's the case, then those teams have a good kind of business case for why they, they want to do that because the effort is going to be uh, high, right? So that effort is not going to be used on solving business uh, problems. So if they have a good business case, then we should not prevent them. But hopefully also when we clarify the team interactions, we're also getting teams to understand better how, should we, how can we collaborate and perhaps instead of saying, well, we're going to go our own way, is try to understand what is the gap in the platform that makes us feel like this is, doesn't meet, meet our needs. And sometimes you might have stream teams with specific needs that they need to address now, and the platform team doesn't have the bandwidth, and that's okay. You know, they are going to take that cost, uh, but you should still keep in mind later on, you know, this might make sense to kind of push down to the platform again. So you know, it evolves over time, and it's essentially trying to set up good um, interactions and good collaboration while letting teams having the ability to decide and feel like, I've, I'm adopting this platform service because it makes sense from a you know, cost benefit point of view. Time for one more question? Or is it coffee time? I think it's coffee time. Coffee one more time. time. Thank you, Manuel. That was awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>